Okay, let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Rebecca Schloman, and I am a senior associate at CLASP. I'm pleased that all of you could join us today for, the, for this webinar. Um, we have some great panelists with us today. So before we go ahead and get started with the environmental dumping perspectives from the ground webinar, I'd like to just go through the agenda. We'll start with some short opening remarks from me, and then we will have panel presentations from our three panelists. Joining us here today are Dr. Gabrielle Dreyfus of IGSD, Mr. Koki Agyarko of the Ghana Energy Commission, and Mr. Adrian Clues of Hinckley Associates, Nigeria. All three panelists will have approximately five to 10 minutes to give their presentations, and then we will move on to a moderated Q&A. I will be asking the panelists a few questions, and then we will open the floor for all of you who have joined us today to submit your questions to the panelists. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive an email with a link to it following the event. To submit your questions during the presentations, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can see it pictured here. We will be um, answering questions during the Q&A portion, but if you have some small questions about technical issues, if you're having any issues with the audio, you can also submit your questions there and my colleagues will address them. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Again, thank you all for joining us today for our environmental dumping perspectives from the ground panel discussion. At CLASP, as part of our cooling program, we have been exploring the issues of dumping of cooling equipment, primarily low efficiency air conditioners and refrigerators that contain a combination of outdated components like compressors or high global warming potential refrigerants. As some of you may know, CLASP and the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development, or IGSD, recently published a report on the environmentally harmful dumping of inefficient and obsolete room air conditioners in Africa. The report, for which we hosted a separate launch webinar, reviews the evidence for dumping of not only obsolete secondhand ACs in Africa, but also the report reveals that some 35% of the room air conditioners sold in Africa do not meet common and internationally adopted efficiency standards. Environmental dumping is a long-standing problem in Africa, and it is in need of resolution. Environmental dumping, as one of our speakers, Gabby, will explain, is the practice of exporting products to another country or territory that contain hazardous substances or have poor environmental performance. Cooling equipment has been our focus here at CLASP. Currently, weak or non-existent minimum energy performance standards and a lack of proactive anti-environmental dumping policies in many African countries have facilitated this dumping issue. There, we see dumping not only of obsolete secondhand products at or near the end of their operational life, but also dumping of inefficient high GWP cooling products. These secondhand products and inefficient products create an additional waste management challenge, as you will hear more about from our speakers. Tackling this environmental dumping challenge will require international cooperation and ambitious anti-dumping policies. Today, CLASP has brought together an expert panel to shed light on the dumping challenge and to discuss potential solutions and next steps. Our panelists today include Dr. Gabrielle Dreyfus, one of our partners on the recent report I mentioned, Mr. Kofi Agyarko, he, is the, he has been a vocal advocate against environmental dumping both in Ghana and within the larger community of African policymakers. And our third panelist is Mr. Adrian Clues of Hinckley Associates Nigeria, which is currently running Nigeria's first government approved e-waste recycling operation. We are very excited to have these three panelists joining us today. With that, I would like to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Gabrielle Dreyfus. She is a senior scientist at IGSD, and Gab Gabby is a climate scientist by training with over a decade of experience working on climate and energy policy with the US government and civil society. Gabby advises the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Program, is a member of the Global Cooling Prize Technical Review Committee, 
and a member, member of the Energy Efficiency Task Force of the Montreal Protocol Technology and Ass Economic Assessment Panel. Gabby, I would like to um, thank you for joining us, and now we'll move on to your presentation. Thanks, Rebecca, and thank you all for being here. It's a real pleasure and honor to be on this panel with a true champion in this space, Kofi Agarika, who will uh, really be providing on the ground perspective, and, and Adrian, um, who will be providing some solutions I, uh, options. So, Rebecca, if you could please bring up the first slide. So I have the distinction to kind of open up and present what is it that we mean when we talk about environmental dumping. Uh, Rebecca spoke to some of the aspects, but what we were, this is a defined term. There was a paper uh, in 2018 in the Duke Environmental Law and Policy Forum that really went through and defined what this is. It is a harmful practice. And it's really a question of exploitation. This is about shipping products to another country or territory that are either hazardous, and that can be the typical definition of hazardous substances, or they can cause harms in other ways, such as having poor environmental performance that is not in the interest or is lower than in the interest of the local and global commons and the local consumer and that actually have a negative impact on the ability of the importing country to fulfill its international environmental treaty commitments. And this applies to refrigeration and air conditioning equipment, both for the refrigerants that these equipment contain, which in many cases, as Rebecca was saying, we find contain refrigerants that are in the process of being phased out. And, um, they uh, or or phased down in the case of HFC the uh, blend the 410A, but in a lot of cases are still using the ozone depleting HCFC 22, and many of the products that are assembled or sold in Africa we found uh, in the report from CLASP are not able to be sold in their country of origin. These are new products that are being assembled or shipped to Africa. There's also a problem of secondhand products that we'll talk about more later. Next slide, please. And I want to really emphasize this issue of uh, harm and exploitation in this trade, which in some cases is legal, but in some cases is illegal when the destination countries have passed laws, for example, specifically banning the importation of secondhand or used equipment. And why is this harmful? It's harmful because it is a waste of money for the consumer. There is a perception that these are good enough for people who otherwise might not have some of these things, but that perception distorts the market. So these appliances often, especially the used ones, uh, have little or no life left and essentially present a burden to the buyer and to the country for dealing with waste management. And these are funds that the consumer and the country could better spend on nutrition, health, education, and infrastructure development. Further, this kind of market deprives the consumer of a smart choice by flooding the market with lower first cost products that over time actually cost the consumer and the country more and prevent the market from having a larger choice of more efficient and climate friendly and consumer friendly uh, equipment. Third, because of the inefficiency of these products, they add to air pollution in many of these countries and uh, electricity is produced using fossil fuels. And this air pollution we know harms health, it damages crops and ecosystems, and it reduces the quality of life. And fourth, by selling these products that use obsolete refrigerants that we know are either scheduled to be phased out or phased down, it essentially ties up these countries with having to deal with these legacy products for years and decades to come. And for servicing, if we want to keep these, if people want to keep these equipment that they've invested in operating, potentially higher costs associated with that. So um, I've got one more slide if I can quickly talk to some of the current events. This is just to tie this, why this is so important now, because we have a health and economic crisis and a climate crisis at the same time. And we know that refrigeration and air conditioning equipment have a disproportionate impact on both climate and development. And so it's so important 
to really recognize and call out and that environmental dumping is happening and what is needed to uh, stop that tide um, so that we can give countries and citizens the, the kind of uh, space that they need for being able to recover from COVID with economic development. And so there are some projects underway uh, and there are some policies that we will highlight, including energy efficiency standards, but also replacement programs that include the proper recovery and recycling and destruction of both the refrigerant gases and of the equipment. And this can lead to better jobs uh, and uh, saving money that can be spent locally. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Kofi. Thank you, Gabby. Uh, I would like to first introduce our next speaker, Mr. Kofi Agyarko. He is the Director of Renewable Energy, Energy Efficiency and Climate Change with the Ghana Energy Commission. In his 18 years of experience in the energy sector, Kofi has designed and successfully implemented a number of energy efficiency projects, including the 2007 Mass CFL Exchange Program, capacitor banks installation, and a Jeff UNDP funded project on energy efficient refrigerators and market transformation in Ghana. He is the ECRI focal point in Ghana and a member of the Energy Efficiency Task Force of the Montreal Paul Technical and Economic Assessment Panel. Kofi, thank you for joining us today, and I'd like to now hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Becky, and, and thank you, Gabriel, for putting the discussion in proper perspective. Permit me, Gabriel, to build on that solid foundation that you have just laid, except that I'm going to be radical. Um, just as you mentioned, environmental dumping occurs in two major ways. You have the so-called new appliances that do not meet the standards. And then we have the second-hand appliances that are discarded from the countries of origin, and then they are dumped on unsuspecting countries. Um, one thing worthy of note here is that when it comes to the second-hand appliances discarded from their country of origin that are dumped on unsuspecting countries, there is an element of fraud. They are fraudulently described as reusable. And I want my audience to check the, the pictures that I have shown. I think that they speak volumes than what words can describe. The, where I have tied reusable, I leave the judgment to my audience to, to, to determine or to judge whether you can call this reusable or they are just garbage that are looking for a final resting place. So by taking a quick look at the uh, pics, I have, I have tagged it the ugly face of dumping. Indeed, it is ugly. Uh, the first pick is the port, and this is our biggest port in Ghana, uh, and it's called Tema Port. Then from the port, you move right to the market. You see the woman busily shopping for um, second-hand free to buy. Then followed by the mechanics shop. It will interest you to know that this woman, having bought that uh, uh, product, that is almost end of life will not enjoy using it much. After some few months, it will start creating problems and the frequency of repairs is burdensome. So she goes to the mechanics shop because the product is obsolete, parts are difficult to come by and they are expensive. In view of the ODS face down and face out, it is not easy to come by the needed refrigerants and parts. So the cost is beyond her ima imagination. So she leaves the fridge there and never returns. When the shop owner becomes tired because he's inundated with these um, used fridges, he also looks at any available space in the street corner and then put it there. 
Then from there, we have these boys who are always pulling carts. I call them scavengers. They will carry it from the street corners to the final graveyard. That is the resting place of fridges called Abu Blushi. Abu Blushi has earned a very bad name because of this very activity. So this is a snapshot. To, to lead you on to what I actually want to present to you. And I want to submit that this topic and that discussion, that is environmental dumping, should be lifted from mere breaches of protocols and conventions because it borders on criminality. Why do I say so? Here in Ghana, we have two laws and, and many sub ones that make these items illegal from being imported or exported into Ghana. So for Ghana, I can say that it is a criminal act that is punishable by law to engage in this kind of um, business. I think that countries, institutions, and individuals will continue to exploit the loopholes in the protocols and the conventions to perpetuate this crime against humanity. If we decide to go business as usual, I think that something needs to be done beyond the protocols and the conventions. And for the sake of time, I'm going to give you two basic reasons why I think that this then goes beyond morality. Even if you tell me that countries without laws, this is illegal, I want you to also consider the angle of morality. Um, here in Ghana, I, I have given you um, the fact that Abu Bloshi has earned a very bad name for all of us. And Abu Bloshi picture that you see there was captured from space. Why is it that it has become so significant that um, um, astronauts decide to take that picture from space? It is for a very bad reason. And that leads me to my first reason why I think that the environmental dumping is a criminal activity. For me, dumping is a deliberate and well calculated plan that is executed with precision to give a bad reputation to a, an innocent country as dirty. Whereas the culprit walks around as a very clean country. And I think that to let one suffer a reputational damage is a criminal activity. And that goes beyond morality. Secondly, I think that environmental dumping is a passage of death sentence on unsuspecting individuals living in, in some corners of this globe. A lot of studies have been conducted on Abu Bulushi. That has come with very scary results. And I want to share just three with you. The first one is that it has been revealed that the fumes from the burning of the plastics and the metals are composed of toxic chemicals and carcinogens. And ladies and gentlemen, how many people have survived cancer around the globe? The second study also revealed that 80% of children living in and around the site have dangerous levels of lead in their blood. The third study, in fact, the, the, the studies are many, but I picked just three. Inhabitants in and around Abu Bulushi are prone to respiratory diseases. That is what the study says. And if WHO confirms that um, people with respiratory diseases are vulnerable to COVID-19, then putting these three results together it amounts to passing a death sentence on these innocent people just because other people want to clean their environment and they think that 
it is it is very good and acceptable to deposit these things in the jurisdiction of other countries just because either those countries do not have the laws either they do not have the standards or they do not have the institutions to enforce these standards it goes beyond the issue of morality i think that this can be described as a crime against humanity and we should be bold to describe it as such touching on the new appliances the effect of um, the bad appliances that come under the guise of new the effect is not different from the effect that is visited on the populace by use and the secondhand appliances you see these new appliances they come with obsolete technologies obsolete refrigerants and when they are dumped the effect on the pockets the 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 the, the local economy is very worrying because people spend more on electricity the, the state has to also invest in capacity expansion with its attendant pollution and, and greenhouse and toxic emissions and all that. It suffice to know that Ghana has hit its wit and when it comes to cheap hydropower. All future expansions, if they are not going to come from renewable sources, then they are going to come from thermal sources. So every megawatt that we add, because of the influx of these um, bad products, you know, impacting negatively on the economy and then the individuals. Let me ask this question. How can a global company in their home country hope to be respected when they exploit export markets with products that will not sell in their own country, products that are rejected by their own citizenry? Why do they think that it is a good thing to push it to other markets just because there are loopholes in the in the in the system? I, I think that the time has come for a global corporation to stop shipping of these products that have been identified as damaging to human health, damaging to local prosperity, and damaging to global environment and i want to use this platform this big platform created by class to extend invitation to all and sundry like-minded individuals institutions um, 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 countries to come on board so that we all put our shoulders to the wheel and end this dumping madness once and for all i want to mention again that this is not an issue of whether um the country has banned it or the country has not banned it it is illegal and it is criminal once lives are at stake it is a criminal act let's lift it beyond morality and stop this thing once and for all thank you very much for your attention thank you kofi for that wonderful call to arms against this dumping challenge. And I think both you, Kofi, and also Gabby have really highlighted this issue that we are talking about with dumping. And, you know, it is a major challenge. And so now I would really like to introduce our next panelist, Mr. Adrian Clouse from Hinckley Associates Nigeria, where he is a managing director. Because I believe that Adrian can shed some light on some of the solutions, at least if not to the practice of dumping, but a solution to what we do with all of the waste that has been generated by dumping. So I would like to introduce Adrian. Adrian has been based in Lagos, Nigeria since 2008 in the role of managing director for Hinkley Group. Hinkley Group provides ICT solutions and end of life services for electronics nationwide. Hinkley Group is currently working on a project to provide second life solutions for solar lithium ion batteries in Nigeria. And in addition, Hinkley delivers world-class IT support for HP. Currently, and the reason we have Adrian joining us today, Hinkley operates Nigeria's first government approved e-waste recycling operation, supporting enterprise business and electrical OEMs. Adrian, I would like to now hand it over to you 
to talk a bit about the work you're doing with Hinkley as, and to shed light on e-waste recycling opportunities. All right, thank you very much. Yep, uh, sadly, I'm not uh, calling in from Nigeria. I'm, I'm, I'm currently in the UK in lockdown and since COVID-19, so, but I'm looking forward to getting back to Nigeria as quickly as possible. Um, okay, so if we can start with my slides, I'll uh, try and uh, maintain my five minutes. Um, okay, so um, we are Nigeria's first government approved e-waste recycler. Um, we've been recycling since 2017. Um, we are into, we have quite a diverse business portfolio, but um, e-waste was certainly one of the areas which we've focused on considerably over the past 10 years. Um, one of the reasons for that is because Nigeria is one of the biggest producers of e-waste on the continent. They produce uh, over 277,000 tons of e-waste per annum. <clears throat> and compared to our neighbors, Cameroon, producing 19,000, Ghana, 39,000, uh, provided by the United Nations uh, University. A couple of years back, those figures. Um, Nigeria does have legislation in place for e-waste since 2011, um, although not strictly enforced, which we'll touch on a little bit later. Um, and we have a very large informal collection network, um, it's estimated at over 100,000 aggregators nationwide, um, majority of them operating in major cities, Lagos, um, Port Harcourt, uh, and Abuja. Um, the informal sector, as you can see here, operate in a, in a crude manner and often in open outdoor spaces, very little regard for health and safety. Um, in terms of earnings, uh, more organized collectors can earn somewhere between $1.68 to $3.36 per day. And the uh, kind of cart pushes, the ones picking up any material of value from the street uh, earn somewhere between 22 cents uh, to 45 American cents per day. So low income groups um, are exposed to very toxic uh, materials uh, generated often from e-waste, but uh, uh, you can see here in some of the pictures are actually um, were doing some open smelting. Uh, this sometimes includes lead from car batteries, which is obviously very harmful and, uh, and uh, can cause lead poisoning, which is fatal. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, it just uh, a quick look at what Hinkley's doing in Nigeria uh, and, and trying to help solve the problem. Um, so Hinkley, I would estimate probably, um, has very little impact on the e-waste problem, if I'm very honest with you. We probably process less than 1% of all the e-waste generated in Nigeria, and I'll explain why that is in a minute. Um, but predominantly, we rely on uh, formal engagements with companies, often OEMs, um, like HP, um, like uh, Higher Thermical, PZ Cousins, um, who make fridges, AC units, TVs, um, and we rely on those types of engagements to 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 keep the company operational. Um, and the way uh, we 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 have developed a process locally for fridges and ACs as well, and we've acquired some equipment in order to to process this correctly. Um, not super high tech, um, but um, it works. Um, it's fairly low power you know energy intensive which is great for nigeria with the, with the power cuts and the expensive cost of running generators and our margins don't allow for that so as you can see from the pictures we have a team of guys trained um, to to separate the various uh, fractions and we also have equipment that can uh, remove the cfc gases uh, uh, from the from the compressors so essentially, um, we, we separate the polyurethane um, foam and the insulation. Uh, we separate the scrap metal. Uh, we remove the compressor. Uh, we um, discharge the gas. Um, we remove the oils. Um, so we, we basically, in summary, in a nutshell, we try and get rid of all the hazardous fractions, separate them from the valuable fractions. Um, we have some solutions for the hazardous fractions, but not all. The, the foam, for example, is a major headache for us. You can see we have 
these tongue bags, jumbo bags filled with foam and with very little we can do with it. Uh, they also are to some extent hazardous um, and contain CFCs. So we have to be careful with those. We can't burn them or incinerate them or something like that, right? Um, the, the, the challenge here though is by the time we've extracted all the value, we're not left with much. Um, the compressors are probably the highest value component that we can recover. We get four to five dollars for a compressor. Uh, scrap metal, per, you know, uh, then you know, you're going to get one compressor per fridge. Scrap metal, two dollars per fridge. Plastic, maybe one dollar per fridge. And then the glass pretty much has no value really. Um, so uh, then the cost of transporting these fridges, I mean, you're, you're moving a lot of air, is very expensive. Logistics in Nigeria is costly. The, it's very, the roads are very congested, the, the road condition is not fantastic, so there's a lot of wear and tear on your truck. Um, so, um, you know, to move a 20-foot uh, container filled with fridges uh, in, within Lagos uh, costs $500 to move the truck to a location, do a collection and come back. Um, you can probably get 60 fridges in a 20-foot container. Uh, so you estimate based on the values for the compressor, the metal and the plastic, you're getting in a region of $480 for your, your 60 fridges. So you've made a loss of $20 before you include the cost of rent, labor and all those other things. Um, so it is a loss making operation for us. So that's probably the biggest challenge and that's why we don't, um, we can't solve the e-waste problem because we, we can't buy these fridges from the informal sector and there's no way they're going to give them to us for free. Um, so really from a recycling perspective, it doesn't make financial sense. Maybe from a refurbishment or repurposing point of view, it can work. But, um, but by the time they get to end of life, um, really, um, yeah, the only way we can make it work is with some sort of uh, subsidy system in place. We know in other countries that they have EPR systems, extended producer responsibility systems, uh, which, which can, we can use to incentivize the informal sector to release the fridges to us. But until that's in place, really, uh, we're only relying on OEM business to business engagements, organizations that want to act responsibly. So that's the major challenge, but other challenges include lack of enforcement from the government, although there's legislation, there's very little enforcement. So you saw my first slide, uh, the informal sector operating outdoors and with no regard to health and safety. That should not really occur. We should find better ways to work with the informal sector and, and work to train them and formalize them and protect them. Not put them out of a job, but uh, just kind of find, ensure that, uh, that they're formalized. Um, there's uh, issues with downstream treatment. There's very little treatment facilities, i.e. For the, for the foam or for the gases. Uh, what do you do with them once you've, uh, once you've separated them or collected them? Um, and then awareness, um, as always, is always a major factor. Uh, and environment not always being top of the agenda for, 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 for individuals or for companies. Maybe just a kind of um, a lack of understanding of the health implications, uh, which Kofi went into in detail. So it's, it's a major problem and something that right now we are unable to resolve on our own. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Adrian, for giving us that background into what you're doing with the recycling in Nigeria, really highlighting some of the challenges particular to recycling these large pieces of cooling equipment like air conditioners and refrigerators. It definitely seems like the solution to the dumping challenge is not just to recycle everything. We really do need to stop the influx of these goods as well. So now that we've heard from all of our panelists, I would like to move on to the Q&A portion of our event. To our attendees, again, I would like to invite you to begin submitting questions for our panelists via the Q&A function at the bottom of the webinar screen. While you think of your questions, I will start off our panelists with a few questions of my own. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen so that we can see everyone. All right, so now that we can see everyone's beautiful faces. So I would just like to kind of build off of this question of, you know, what, how do we solve this dumping challenge? So we've just heard from Adrian that, you know, recycling is not currently, at least at its current scale, a cost-effective solution to dealing with all of this e-waste. And so I'd like to hear from Gabby and Kofi, 
you know, both of you work with the with the Montreal Protocols TEEP assessment panel, and I'd like to understand, you know, this is a critical issue dealing with these refrigerants. So what are what are the approaches we're seeing kind of at that global scale? What's the conversation been like with your Montreal Protocol compatriots? How can we resolve this challenge? So one of the key questions that the TEEP Energy Efficiency Task Force has been asked to look at is to help inform uh, the parties, which are to the Montreal Protocol, which are all the countries in the world, um, to give them examples of best practices for dealing with issues both for ex accessing the good uh, energy efficient and climate friendly technologies but we're also looking at uh, case studies uh, for dealing with some of these issues, in, including how you prevent the dumping of inefficient and obsolete products, both new and used or secondhand. And so uh, one thing uh, I'd like to highlight, as I mentioned in my first slide, the 2018 paper in the Duke Environmental Law Journal put together actually a list of 11 tools that uh, countries can use to uh, prevent some of this dumping. And this includes uh, some of the policies that Ghana has put in place, like I'll let Kofi speak to. But one of the really important messages from this is no single tool is enough. And that this is the responsibility just not, not just of the destination country, which are often countries that have um, a lot of other issues that they need to be prioritizing. But because of the flow of these directions, a lot of the exporting countries uh, also should be putting in place uh, and, uh, responsibilities for reducing these flows. So um, Kofi, I didn't know if you want to speak to this a little bit more. Yes, I think that uh, Gabriel has said it all. What I want to add is that in the, in, as part of that discourse, we will have to um, explore how we can make the shipping countries also responsible. Just as he said, um, um, stopping this kind of menace does not lie in the bosom of the receiving country alone. Think that the exporting country also has a responsibility. And here in Ghana, for instance, we spend thousands of dollars every month by way of enforcement just to stop this thing from coming. I think that if the exporting countries are, 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 are made responsible for their actions, these monies that we are spending by way of enforcement can be applied to other um, useful areas of the economy that can improve the living standards of the people. So that angle will also have to be looked at and discussed in the uh, protocol bit that we are looking at. Thank you, Gabby and Kofi. So to follow up on that, we received a question about is it the right is it a lack of regulation in export exporting countries like the EU or the USA? Or is it a lack of regulation and enforcement in importing countries that is the chief problem? It sounds, Kofi, like what you're saying is it's a combination of both and we need solutions both with, within the importing countries as well as within the exporting countries. Would you agree with that? Sure, uh, that, is, that is so. In fact, if you check the countries that are suffering most in Africa, some of them do not have the regulations at all. Some have a regulation, I'm talking about the standards. Some have the standards, but the standards are weak. Some also do not have the institutions to enforce the standards. One thing that needs to be made clear here is that in, in Africa and in, in most of the developed world, the standards are a means to an end they are not an end in themselves. So you need very strong institutions and very strong individuals to ensure that the standards are enforced and people comply because of the complex 
society that we live in. Our societies are not as advanced as uh, those in Europe and elsewhere. So you need people who can be able to uh, maneuver the complex society to be able to enforce these standards. So that is something that we all need to be aware of. And I want to also say that the shipping countries, either they are caused to be responsible or on their own, they take responsibility and assist us in, in cleaning our environment because we also deserve to live in a very clean environment. Yeah, can I add to that, Rebecca? Go ahead. Yeah, um, there's a really interesting study by, it's called Person the Port, conducted by United Nations University uh, in coordination with the Basel uh, Coordination Center. And uh, they actually had uh, team members positioned in, in the key uh, ports, shipping ports in Nigeria, the largest one, Tinkan Island in Apapa. Um, and they actually monitored um, the importation of uh, elect used electronics into the country. And it was really interesting from the study because they thought they would see containers full of old fridges and computers and monitors coming in. But what they actually saw more of was these roll on roll of vehicles like vans and cars stuff full of electronics so um they actually were able to get some photographs of you know vehicles with printers you know stuck pressed up against the glass of the of the car so it was very evident that these vehicles were being declared as a vehicle and the contents weren't being declared so that they, they estimated that eighteen thousand tons of used electronics were coming into nigeria through this method um so it's all undeclared used electronics a lot of them almost at the end of life so Really, there is a there is a an obligation on both sides, you know, the exporting country and the importing country to actually properly check. Um, it is quite obvious; it wasn't something very well hidden. I mean, these things could from the out exterior of the vehicle you could see it was stuff full of electronics. So, it needs to be more done at customs, I would imagine. Thank you. So that kind of leads me to another question we've received. So. One of our attendees has asked, what is Interpol doing in it to ensure adequate elimination or stop of these environmental crimes or, or to enforce compliance with the necessary standards and environmental laws? Is this something that we're seeing a, is this dumping issue something that we're seeing a response from Interpol or other international, you know, organizations? Um, or, or have we, are we currently lacking that sort of enforcement? from a large international body. Do any of you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know, sorry again, I, I, I'm not sure if it was Europol or Interpol, but I know that they were putting GPS trackers inside CRTs and um, they did track some from, from I, think it was, um, I think it was either Germany or, or Belgium into Lagos. And they tracked to the, to the actual person who bought the TV set, you know, and it was obviously, wasn't declared and CRTs are a legal import into Nigeria anyway, but it made its way through. And the, the owner of this TV was saying that he'd had a problem with the TV and opened it up and he had found this GPS tracker and he was always wondering, what, what is this thing? <laughs> Until actually the, uh, the enforcement agents with some, uh, uh, some of the international agencies came and, 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 and tracked the, the device. So, so they are doing things, but probably, probably needs to be some more uh, collaboration between the government in, within the African countries and, and international uh, governments to, to really make a bigger impact. But despite all the bans and the importation bans, clearly the waste is still making its way. So we have a, a question about, you know, a potential solution. So we've heard that, you know, recycling right now is hard to, it's not, it's not, um, it's not yet cost effective, right? It's not at the scale where it's cost effective. So one of our attendees has asked, how about an investment fund created by major cooling product manufacturers to support anti-dumping compliance and to scale cooling e-waste process and management? Uh, do we think that donor funding would be sufficient to address this challenge or insufficient? Um, yeah, I think the, the, the only system that I've seen that I, I found interesting was, was a system whereby subsidies are paid at the point of sale. Uh, sorry, the subsidies are 
paid by the probably the best position will be the OEMs, the 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 organisations that are making the most margin on on the equipment. That you see, the problem is is that the OEMs typically will put the responsibility on the company that imports the units into the country. So a lot of these companies don't. A lot of the big OEMs won't have an office in Lagos or in Nigeria. So they don't take the responsibility. They say, no, well, we didn't import it into Nigeria. That was our distributor, Mr. X, Y, and Z. But Mr. X, Y, and Z are busy trying to make money on a very difficult exchange rate and uh, will probably not be minded to pay into any kind of subsidy or EPR system. Um, so really, I think the focus should be on the OEMs, the organizations that manufacture the products and sell into these countries that they, if they're going to put these products on the market, that they need to take responsibility for them. And there needs to be um, some of the margin needs to be obviously um, reinvested into collection and recycling practices, um, because without that, uh, there's no way to kind of impact the informal collection network. Kofi, did you have something you wanted to add that as well? Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask a rhetorical question by way of reacting to the question at stake. Um, Becky, um, if there is, to me, a simple solution to a problem, why do we have to go in circles? The simple solution to this problem is number one, commitment by countries who do the shipping. Commitment, if they are committed to respect the countries where these things are dumped, I think that is the first step. Even before the carriers come in, the, the shipping lines who carry those things, I think that um, just as we indicated earlier on, maybe the, the, the international conventions and protocols are not biting enough. And that is why it has always given room for exploitation. If we can make the conventions and protocols very biting, that is what will scare individuals, institutions, and nations from doing these things, rather than uh, putting maybe the blame on the manufacturer or whatever. I think that in every country we have factory inspectors who move from fa one factory to another to inspect production, whether they conform to the standards of that country. So if they are found not to uh, conform to the standards of that country, why should it be shipped out? That is the first question that needs to be answered. So I think that let us rather find ways and means of getting commitment from the industrialized nations. Once we get the commitment, I think that about 80% of the battle will be won. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you. So that, that leads me, I want to direct a question to Gabby. Um, Gabby, I know that you and your colleagues at IGSD do a lot of work and communicate a lot with manufacturers of these types of cooling products. What would you say is needed to better engage industry in this conversation around dumping and to really bring them to the table to resolve this issue? Yeah, so one of the things that has been really interesting as we've looked at this issue is getting more granular sense of um, who the different players are. So there are uh, actors in it, the manufacturing sector, the supplier sector, who have products that uh, they could be selling, but don't have, uh, the market conditions are not necessarily conducive for them to bring some of these more efficient uh, climate-friendly products into to the market. So I think that there is, um, I think as Kofi was saying, there are, there's a number of actions needed. And I think recognizing that this is a problem is the first action that's needed. And we're starting to see that with these reports uh, and we're as, and defining th this problem. Um, and I think that there is uh, an awareness that uh, there's a role um, to be putting in place policies, um, but as, as Kofi said, policies are pieces of paper. There's, a, there's need for support 
on the institutions and the individuals and really on the upstream to, 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 to shift some of that burden. And part of that upstream um, is also identifying the, the partner actors who also, uh, if uh, properly incented, uh, have a really important role to play in shifting these markets. Um, and so one of the things that we're, we're working on is, is getting greater clarity on what's going on so that when we um, engage with manufacturers, we, we can be uh, very clear with them about what needs to happen. You know, what are the barriers to them getting into the market? Uh, how can those barriers be addressed? Um, you know, some of those uh, include uh, you know, closing loopholes in the country of manufacture. Um, that is allowing competition essentially, because you do have to recognize that this is, these often are competitive markets, and that if a manufacturer feels that they have to compete for market share by uh, selling low efficiency, obsolete equipment because of those loopholes, then we need to work together to close them, to bring the market up, and so that they have the right marketplace in which to sell those better products. So um, there are, I think, opportunities for collaborative solutions, but there does, we also do need to be vigilant in identifying and uh, creating uh, disincentives uh, to, from the actors who might undermine that, this kind of uh, collaborative solution. Thank you, Gabby. So I think one of those disincentives can be policy, right, and having the having the right policies in place in the countries of import to at least make it more difficult to practice something. And so on that note, we've received a couple questions that kind of get at this idea of having some sort of regional policy in place. What are some, um, and maybe this can go to Gabby and Kofi and Adrian, you might have some insight as well from your work in the e-waste sector, but what are some of the regional approaches that we could look to implement in Africa to try and really create these disincentives for dumping? Yeah, uh, Becky, I think that, 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 that this is a very uh, punchy question, uh, a, a very relevant question to ask. Um, from where I sit, I think that we need regional harmonization of standards. Not all the countries in West Africa, for instance, have the capacity, manpower and financial capacity to develop standards and, and uh, top it up with regulations to make enforcing uh, legal. However, there are some countries who have advanced uh, 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 there's no need reinventing the wheel. So we can adopt a common standard. When we do that, then we succeed in insulating the whole region against the influx of these unwanted um, products. Because a practical case in point is that a, a, a product, a consignment that was returned I mean, it was busted at the port. We asked the importer to re-export. It eventually ended in our next door, that is La Côte d'Ivoire. An attempt was made to uh, ferry it by road to Ghana again, but by the vigilance of the enforcement officers, we nipped that uh, attempt in the bud. So if we all have the standards, then one thing that is rejected in Ghana will not be accepted in Togo, neither will it be accepted in Senegal, so that then there's no market for those bad products. I think that is a way to go. And uh, we have started, uh, ECOWAS have started, and we have gotten to an advanced stage to kind of uh, harmonize our standards. But the gate, the question is, Maybe enforcement is very robust in Ghana. Could that be said of the other countries? If enforcement is weak, that country is prone to become a conduit for these substandard appliances to enter. But at least half loaf is better than none. The first step should be harmonized standards. Thank you. 
Thank you, Kofi. So we've got another question, um, and this is more for you, Adrian. So we've kind of like discussed how we can cooperate from a policy side. And you mentioned that your organization works with a lot of other organizations and producers that want to act responsibly. What are the benefits these organizations can see from engaging in sustainable practices that maybe could be used as incentives for other organizations to join and become more responsible? Yeah, I mean, it ties in nicely what Kofi was just saying, because um, I mean, there is law in Nigeria, so these companies are required to comply and they are expected to ensure that the electronics are recycled correctly. Um, so really, there should never be a question mark, you know, as to why they do it. It's the law. The reason why a lot most companies don't do it is because there isn't enough enforcement. So, uh, you know, I think if you hit the nail on the head, it's like having policy and legislation is one thing, but having enforcement is a completely another thing on its own. It's separate. The, 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 a lot of these agencies are not well funded. Um, uh, you know, the environmental agencies are not as well funded as perhaps some of the other agencies and they don't have the manpower on ground to be able to cover the ground and, and ensure that all companies comply with this legislations and the standards so um, I think the reason why the big companies comply the multinationals and the uh, well the multinationals let's take them on their own they have a global environmental policy which they obviously have to implement in all countries including Nigeria um, they can't be selective um, and then if we look at some other some of the other customers that we have are ISO 14001 certified so they have a requirement not just to uh, dispose of the electronics but to know how they, they are where, where they go at the end of the life and how they're treated and etc so they need to know the whole the whole uh, chain uh, of those electronics but um, but then the other reason will be that typically enforcement will focus on the companies that are well established and uh, can be targeted to pay the penalties um, that are associated with breaking the e-waste legislation and the laws. So if we take example, NTN, for example, in Nigeria, they they breached some of the government policies and they they faced million dollars of you know million dollar fines uh, as a result but other players are also breaching the same rules but ntm were were targeted um because they're they're a major major player in, in in the industry and that goes across the board so typically our customers will be companies that will be targeted by the enforcement agencies and for that reason we'll be very careful and ensure that they comply with the legislation um, and, and that's how we run as a business. That's what we rely on. So if we could expand that enforcement to, to reach a wider group of sets of organizations, then I, I wouldn't have a problem. I, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be very wealthy. <laughs> Sadly, I'm not. <laughs> but hopefully if this enforcement can, can, can be implemented and the funding can be put in place to, to, for these agencies um, to operate more widely, then, then we will see a better compliance level. Thank you, Adrian. So I'd like to just add, I know that we're a few minutes over our scheduled end time. And for those questions that we haven't been able to get to, we will follow up via email with responses to all of those questions. Um, I think if our panelists have time still, maybe we can take one more question. So I'd like to, oops, sorry, where did it go? So I'd like, or maybe instead of questions, I wanna give each of you um, just like a minute to just kind of wrap up what you really want the attendees on this call to take away from our conversation today. We've heard a lot about you know, the different approaches we can take, whether at the national level, the regional level, whether through international organizations or even through just collaboration with industry. And so maybe we can start with Gabri, Gabby and just go through Gabby, Kofi and Adrian, just kind of give your last one minute uh, takeaway that you want everyone to have. Yeah, I think a really awareness of the fact that just because it may seem that it is legal to do some of these things. In many cases, um, it, this kind of environmental dumping that we're talking about, of uh, essentially 
shipping obsolete, inefficient, uh, end of life, but also new products that you couldn't sell in the country manufacturer is harmful. And that uh, we need to have governments and manufacturers and suppliers all recognize this so we can work together uh, to put in place the laws, practices, people, but also change some of the key practices uh, upstream and downstream to 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 stop this and because it does impact people's lives and Adrian, maybe you can go first because I imagine Kofi will have something to say to close mm -hmm. us off um, what's what's what would you like people to take away from this conversation today? Yeah, I would say um, currently, you know the health and the safety of not just Nigerians, but I imagine Africans, although Nigeria is my area of focus. Um, you know, we have a population of 200 million in Nigeria. Um, we have a, a serious um, challenge here in terms of not, you know, e-waste as a whole is posing significant uh, risks to people's health. And, uh, and it's not really been addressed significantly at an international level um, and, and at a local level and more needs to be done environment typically isn't the pr priority there's so many other, i know there's a lot of other challenges in nigeria you know that they have bigger headaches Gen just basic health care is a problem uh education is a problem uh, um so obviously e-waste in, <laughs> in the environment sometimes doesn't seem as pressing but the reality is this is having an immediate impact on people's health when they're open when they're releasing cfc gases into the environment or even worse what we've witnessed you know open smelting of lead you know i mean that, that's an immediate impact on the person's health they're not going to live very long um so it really does need to be taken seriously at all levels and uh, we certainly all need to work together to solve it it's, uh, it's not just one party or one individual so i hope we can do that and having more conversation like this will help and so thank you very much for your time Yes. Um, thank you very much, class, for um, giving this, dedicating this platform to the course of this important subject to be discussed and the awareness that we need to create. Um, I just want to say that environmental dumping absolutely is inimical to the growth and the prosperity of every country. Here in Africa, we record the lowest electricity access rate. And part of the problem is attributed to the use of obsolete and inefficient appliances. They are termed energy gasless by the Americans. They, they, they consume the energy like drinking Coca-Cola. And even those in the advanced world who have enough of electricity are doing everything that they can to ensure efficient utilization of energy. What about those of us who do not have enough? I think that we will have to attach much importance to this issue of dumping that we are dealing with. It scares away investors. We will continue to remain where we are and investors will not come because no investor will want to invest in a country where the market has been taken over by this kind of junks. No investor will do that. And the people of Africa will be perpetually kept impoverished if we are unable to resolve this canker that we are dealing with so if you have a relative a friend who is involved in this business analysis that we have done in ghana indicates that it is very lucrative that is why it has become a challenge for people to stop but please be an a change agent tell that relative tell that friend that this is not good for your people so it needs to be stopped 
and then our compatriots in Europe and elsewhere. We are extending hands of friendship to you, hands of collaboration and cooperation. Come on board so that we can uh, fight this canker together. And I think that if we all put our shoulders to the wheel, this subject will become a thing of the past. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kofi, and thank you to all of our panelists who have joined us today. It's been a really interesting conversation, and I appreciate all of you, you know, taking the time out of your schedules to join us. And as I mentioned, we've received a lot of questions from attendees, and we will be following up, following this um, webinar with some responses to those questions that we weren't able to get to. And so I would also like to thank all of our attendees for joining us and providing us with those great questions. And with that, uh, we will be ending our presentation. And I would like to just invite everyone to keep an eye out for future webinars and publications from class, as well as some of our other partners. We will be continuing to work on this issue of environmental dumping. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks also to those who Thank share you. their experiences. There's a lot to learn still on this topic. Bye. Bye.